Hi, in this video, I'll be covering eight things to consider when choosing your electromechanical relay. The eight items are as follows. The physical size and pin arrangement and whether the relay comes with a holder. The relay coil voltage, whether it's AC or DC in order to drive the relay. The coil resistance or the coil current required. The contact or relay ratings. The opening and closing capacity of the relay. Contact types, whether they're single group, double group, single pole, single throw, whether they're normally open, normally closed the make and break cycles, test options on the relay housings, and possible environmental conditions. Right, the first thing is the pin arrangement and physical size of the relay and also whether you can get a holder for it. Now, looking at the physical size, this is a 12 volt relay. This is also a 12 volt relay and you can see they are completely different sizes, obviously because of the current carrying capability of the contact. Then having a look at these two over here, these are automotive relays. They will be put in a motor car. But if you have a look underneath, you can see the pin arrangements are different. They are both 30 amp relays. They have a similar specification, but you can see the packaging is different. Over here, I've got a quad pole relay and you can see the pin outs over there. Now, not all quad pole relays will look like this, so that's why it's important to match the pin outs to your application. For example, maybe you have a relay holder, something that looks like this. This would have been soldered into your circuit board and you would unplug and plug in your relay. This is useful when your relays often go faulty and you have to change the relay or test the relay or service the relay. Now your driving circuit, the circuit that is going to be connected to your coil, may be AC or DC. It depends on your application. Now over here, I've got two different relays. One of these is an AC relay and one is a DC relay. What I mean by that is it's the voltage that is applied to the coil that determines whether this is an AC connection or a DC connection. So on the underside, these two relays actually look the same. But if you have a look at the voltage that's required to energize the coil, you can see that this is a 220, 240, or a, basically a 230 volt relay, meaning that it needs 230 AC volts sitting on the coil wires in order for this relay to operate. Now the relay on the left has very similar pin outs, but if you have a look at the coil voltage, it's actually a 12 volt DC coil. So there you can see it's even imprinted on the side there, it says 12 volts. So this would require a DC voltage to operate the relay. So in choosing the relay, it's important to determine what your driver, your primary circuit voltage will be. Over here, I've got a six volt relay. This relay only requires six volts across these terminals, DC volts, in order to operate the relay. These automotive relays generally require 12 volts, but some automotive relays operate at 24 volts. Right, the next thing to consider is how much current is required to drive your relay. And the way to work that out is to look at the resistance between the terminals of the coil. Now, we'll also need to know the voltage of the relay. Now, in this case, this is a 6-volt relay. And then I'll also do the same example with this relay. This is a 24-volt relay. I'm going to start with the 6-volt relay and measure the resistance. I've got my meter here. And if I just show you the resistance of the leads, we're looking at about 1.5 ohms of the leads. Right, so there I'm measuring the resistance across the coil. The meter is saying 60.3 ohms. You just need to minus the lead resistance of 1.5 ohms and I can work out the current required to drive this relay. Right, just using Ohm's law, V equals I times R, I took the voltage that's required for the relay to operate, 6 volts divided by the resistance of the coil, and because the resistance of the coil was on the lowest side, I just minus the lead resistance of the leads of my meter, and I get a current requirement of 0.102 amps to drive this relay. Right, I now have my 24 volt relay and the resistance is about 700 ohms. I'm not going to minus the lead resistance because it'll be negligible. So it's 24 divided by 700. In order to operate this relay, I need a current of 0 0.03 amps. So having a look at these two relays, you can see that this relay requires 0.1 amps and this relay over here requires 0 0.03 amps. So this relay requires three times less current, although the voltage is much higher for this relay to operate. I'll now demonstrate this and show you the current measurements. Right, so here's the six volt relay. I've set the supply to six volts and I'm now gonna measure the DC current. The relay is now operated and you can see the current is 98 milliamps, so 0 0.01 milliamps as predicted. Right, I'm now going to measure the 24 volt relay. I've connected the supply, the 24 volts, and you can see that I'm getting the 34 milliamps as predicted. 
Now the next thing is the relay rating. What current is going to be flowing through the contacts and is it going to be DC voltage or AC voltage? Very important. So let's first look at these two timers. Now I've got these timers here because relays are often used in timers. Now the reason I've got these timers here is timers are often used for pool pumps. So that would be a motor load. That is an inductive load generally. And an inductive load tends to have a high turn on current. And I'll explain that in a little bit more detail shortly. Now, now other timers are used for lighting. Some lighting is resistive, some of it is tungsten. Now some of these timers are used for lamps. Some of these lamps may be LED and they've got almost a capacitive effect. Some of the lighting uses a filament like a bulb and that has a temperature coefficient which changes the resistance when it is hot and cold and all of these things need to be factored in when specifying the relay current. So let's first start with the basics. Over here I have this relay and it says there it can handle 240 volts AC or a maximum of 28 volts DC. Notice how the DC voltage specification is almost always lower, much lower than the AC specification. And there is the maximum current, 15 amps. So you can have a 15 amp load on a 230 volt AC circuit for example, but if you're using it for a DC application, the contacts can only open a 15 amp load at a maximum of 28 volts DC. Here is a very common automotive relay and here you can see this can open a 30 amp load. And by the way, generally the higher the load current that can flow between the contacts, also means that the relay requires more force to open those contacts and that usually means the relay will require more current on the coil side. Now on this 24 volt DC relay we've got a maximum current carrying capacity of 5 amps if you connect 230 or 240 volts between the contact terminals and if you're using DC notice again significantly lower voltage 30 volts at 5 amps. Now just keep in mind this voltage over here, the DC voltage, that is the voltage to operate the coil. And lastly this much smaller 12 volt relay can handle 3 amps at 220 volts but notice it can only handle 3 amps at 30 volts DC. So the thing we need to know is are we using an AC load or a DC load? The next thing is working out the current. Are we going to be exceeding 3 amps? Then we would need a bigger relay. How do you determine whether you're going to exceed 3 amps? I'll quickly go into that now. Right, over here I've got a basic diagram. You can see I've got an AC supply. It could be a DC supply. It really doesn't matter. The principle remains the same. When I close this switch, current will flow through this purely resistive load that has a power factor of one. Let's say, for example, this was a stove. Now what would happen as soon as you close the contact or operate the relay, current will flow, it will reach a maximum pretty quickly. When you de-energize the relay, you can see we get the step function and when we close the relay again, it's pretty close to the maximum. There might be a little bit of ringing there just because of dirty contacts and things like that. The point is, is that the turn on current and the steady state current are pretty similar. So if you have a 1000 watt load, you could specify the relay based on that power. So for example, if you're going to be using this with a 220 volt supply, so in this case the power is simply VI, the cos phi is equal to 1 because it is unity power factor because it's purely resistive load. So if you want to work out the current it would be 1000 because we know that this load is 1000 watts, maybe it says so on the appliance and you divide it by the voltage and you'll get your current. So this is a 4.5 amp current. So that would mean that a 5 amp relay would be sufficient. Personally, I always try to go 20% above. So in this case, I would choose a 5.5 amp relay as the minimum relay to open and close this current for a purely resistive load. Now over here I've got a motor load and you can see there's my AC supply and it's still 220 volts and let's close the switch and the motor at that exact moment when the contacts are closed, the relay is operating, you will see a waveform that looks something like this. There is a current surge and the reason being is the motor is not turning so the current sees a dead short across the terminals. 
Once the current flows, the inductance in the motor builds up a magnetic field and therefore we start seeing an impedance which reduces this current. But the point is, is that current there is very different to the steady state current. And in many applications, it is between five to nine times higher than the steady state motor current. If you have a motor that's rated at 1.1 kilowatt and it's 220 volts, the steady state current might be five amps, but if you look at the peak current, the inrush current, we can see that for this motor, I'm taking it as a six times the steady state current. So that is 30 amps turn on current. Now, where do I find this information? This you find on the data sheet of the motor, the face plate, or you can measure it. But with these higher currents, you may need to use a current clamp because handheld multimeters usually cannot measure above 10 amps. Now in this case, even though my running current is 5 amps, I could not use a 5 amp relay. I would need to find a relay that can handle at least 33 amps. Remember, I'm still giving a 10% increase just in case there are other disturbances on that line. So in some cases, you want to pair the relay with a contactor. And then just having a look when transformers switch on, they tend to oscillate. That also is important for your relay choice. And then also incandescent lamps, while they may just say 100 watts, you've got to be careful because the turn on current is much higher. Look at this. Normal current for a 100 watt globe filament type incandescent would have been 0.43 amps. But on turn on, we're getting 4 amps. Why? Because the resistance changes depending on the temperature. As the temperature increases, the resistance increases. But in order to increase the temperature, current first has to flow. It is a very fast process, but nevertheless, the relay is still subjected to this high current. Right, so in choosing your relays, you might need to apply a derating factor. Over here, I have an electrical timer switch. You would use this for your geyser, your boiler, pool pump, floodlights, whatever you want to use it for. But notice there is a derating notice on the cover of the timer. Look, it says maximum load 21 amps for resistive, but if it's an inductive load, they've derated it by at least 50%. Look at that. It is only 10 amps for inductive loads. So inside the timer switch, there is a relay. So what we're doing is we're actually derating the specification of the relay because of the type of load. Now, the next thing to look out for are the contact types. For example, this is a single pole, single throw relay, which means it just operates as an opening and closing switch. It's only got two poles. So here's an example. You can see there's one contact there and one contact there. And when the relay operates, it just closes those two contacts and that is all. Over here, I have a single pole double throw relay and you can see that two of the contacts are normally closed. Only when the relay operates does the state change and what will happen is this link will move to there and A and C will become closed. What we have here is a normally closed connection and a normally open connection on the same relay. Over here, I have an example. These are the two leads to energize the relay. But if you have a look at the contact side, we have one, two, three poles. You can see that two of the contacts are already closed. The relay is not energized. It is off. And what happens is these are normally closed. Then when we energize the relay, we can see that the other two contacts close. So the one set are normally closed and the other set is normally open. It closes only when we activate the relay. Then we also get the double pole single throw and then the double pole double throw. And then we get multiple groups. For example, over here, I've got three groups and over here, I've got four groups. You can see on the four group, I actually have 12 connectors for the contacts. Now, the next thing to consider is the make and break cycles. For example, if your relay is going to be used continuously opening and closing things, maybe it is a flashing light that goes continuously, then you'd need to look at the data sheet to look at the cycles, the number of cycles the relay can handle before it's past its lifespan. Over here, I have a data sheet for a heavy duty relay. The mechanical lifespan is 10 million operations and under rated load, it is 100,000 operations. These and other specifications are stated in the data sheet. Now, it's sometimes useful if the relay has a test facility. For example, over here, both these relays have a test button. You can operate the relay manually without applying any current to the coil. Right, so over here, I've got the multimeter set to continuity. And watch what happens when I push this test button here. You can hear it is now a short circuit. Some relays have a test button on the top. When I depress this pin, it operates the relay. This is useful in troubleshooting. Sometimes it's difficult to apply the voltage, but you still want to 
test the load to see if the load is operating if the relay was in a working condition. So you can see there I'm forcing the relay to operate by pressing this pin, checking if the load would operate correctly. Right, just a few more things to consider are the IP ratings and the environmental conditions where you'll be using your relay. One of the first things is the noise. Some relays make quite a loud click sound and if you're going to be having that in the cabin of a car and it's got click, 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 click or on a high-end hi-fi system, you might want to have a relay that is more insulated in terms of noise. You can measure these things using an SPL meter. Some relays can handle a little bit more moisture than others. For example, some relays just have an open housing and moisture can get into the relay while others are sealed. Now, relays are also subject to corrosion and carbon buildup, especially on the contact. You can see over there, there is a bit of carbon that is built up between the contact. If the relay is going to be working in an environment where there is a lot of corrosion, you might need to consider a special type relay. Also over time, especially if there's a lot of arcing, relays can build up carbon on the terminals. Right over here, I've got a relay with a bit of carbon that's built up on the contacts. I'm applying the 24 volts to this 24 volt relay and I'm measuring the resistance between the two terminals that are now closed. Notice the resistance is showing eight kilo ohms. And if I just tap these contacts, you can see how this contact resistance is changing considerably. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna clean the contacts using a contact cleaner. I use Contact Chemi Contact 60 and all I do is I just spray a little bit between the contacts there and then I just rub the contacts together. I can actually switch off the relay and if you want to, you can even gently file the contacts. But in this case, I'm just going to open and close the relay several times. Right, now have a look at the contact resistance just from the spray. There you can see 1,6 ohms and there again, totally solved that dirty contact problem. Just remember that many relays spark when the contacts touch and if you're using the relay in a gaseous or a flammable environment, then you've got to consider things like that as well in terms of a sealed relay. So it's a very good idea to match your relay to the application. Here is an epoxy sealed relay, very good for air conditioning control. And over here, I've got a different type of relay. And while I have the data sheet here, you can have a look. There is the resistance and the dielectric strength and then the environmental characteristic you can see this one operates minus 10 to plus 55 degrees while if you go back to this epoxy sealed relay you can see that its operating conditions are superior minus 55 all the way up to 85 degrees centigrade all right so that brings you to the end of this video and thanks for watching and cheers